evening. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ijomo Wabanga. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hall Hospital Women's Society and Donor Relations Associate for the Raw Alex Hospital Foundation. So for those who do not know, the Lois Hall Hospital Women's Society is an organization of people in all ages and stages of life, passionate about and committed to raising excellence in women's health care and treatment. The society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hall Hospital for Women. While this lecture is prominently virtual, I want to emphasize their passion doesn't rest with events online. This past year, with the opportunity to return to in-person events, the Women's Society has been able to celebrate our five-year anniversary with XYC Brewing, and more recently, host a shopping event with Simon's Fashioning the Future and raising $25,000 for the Indigenous Cultural Partnership at the Lewis Hall. Since its inception, the Women's Society has been able to raise $850,000 in support of the hospital, supporting equipment like such as the Firefly, an upgrade to the Da Vinci Surgical Robot, and the Obix Perinatal Interface System. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for supporting the Women's Society and our mission. We host our Mind and Body Talks as an inclusive speaker series to engage and stay connected with our community. I want to give a big thank you to Trish, who's here from Boot Bros, um, and for their continued support of What the Health. Everyone, please welcome Trish, who's going to do our land acknowledgement this evening before we get started. Thank you, Ajoma. I'm super excited to be here tonight, and thank you for having me. So hello everyone. Yes, my name is Trish and I work within the Community Impact Team and I'm honored to be here tonight on behalf of Alberta Blue Cross to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the City of Edmonton and us the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations such as Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene and Nakota Sioux. We are taking this important moment here today to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you so much, Trish. Now, before we dive into tonight's session, I just have a couple of housekeeping things um, and just some things to let you guys know if you haven't attended uh, one of the sessions before. Um, and if you have, then it's just a reminder. Um, tonight, we are honored to have guest speaker, Tila. Um, we are hoping you will come away from this presentation feeling educated about the various causes and effects of birth trauma, as well as provide insights into how women who have experienced birth trauma can find support and resources to help them heal. This is a safe space, so if anybody has any questions, um, they can be answered. Um, you can type them into the Q&A chat box, and then following the presentation, we will start reading them. Um, the lecture will be recorded and post it on the Women's Society YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you would like to rewatch or share it, then it'll be on our channel. Um, tonight, we're using Zoom webinar. So each of the panelists will appear as they speak. You will not need to worry about your own video being displayed. And we hope that you enjoy this viewing experience. We're also using the live transcript function. If you would like to see the available transcript, please enable this on your personal computer. At the end of the session today, there will be a survey emailed following um, and we'd love to have your feedback. Anyone who fills out this survey is entered into a draw to win a $25 gift card. Um, it's true. There won't be, I know sometimes there are scam emails, but if you get an email from Boo Austin with us. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to introduce Tila um, and she will take the floor. Um, so Tila Tomasetti is a registered provisional psychologist and doctoral candidate in Alberta, Canada, who specializes in the area of birth trauma. Prior to this, Tila has been a therapist for two decades, supporting survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, childhood sexual abuse, and tragic losses. After suffering her own birth trauma by way of midwifery violence and an excessive hemorrhage almost taking her life in 2021, Tila decided to start the fast-growing Instagram account, The Tea on Birth Trauma, where she breaks the silence and supports thousands of survivors in finding their voices. Her doctoral research begins this spring and will focus on the fond trauma response in birth trauma survivors, the intersectionality of race, gender, and systemic oppression, and how providers can begin to dismantle it. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Tila. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm just going to take a moment here to share my screen. And it just needs to be disabled there, and then I'll be good to go. And while we wait for that. Good to go. 
Awesome. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, while we wait for that, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. It is absolutely gorgeous outside. I had the opportunity to step outside in between clients today and this presentation, and it is finally starting to feel like spring. So thank you for spending your evening with me talking about something that is not always an easy topic uh, to talk about and hold space around. So I just wanted to thank the Lois Hole Women's Society um, and start off the evening by doing such because this is such an important topic and I'm just really grateful for the space tonight to do it. Okay, so as she shared is that I'm a registered provisional psychologist and before specializing in this area, I have worked with a variety of different styles of trauma. And I always think that's important to share with people so they understand the lens that I'm coming from and uh, the different kind of topics that I've been encountering in my therapy spaces over the years. I am a doctoral candidate. And so what that means is that I'm not a doctor yet, is that I have been able to work through all of the coursework and passed my eight week long comprehensive exam <laughs> that just ended two weeks ago and I passed. So yay. And the next step actually starts in three days. I start my doctoral project, which as Ajima shared, is going to be focusing on the intersectionality of race gender and the fawn trauma response in birth trauma survivors and i'll touch on this a little bit later i also feel like it's important whenever i start off presentations to speak to the fact that i don't just sit across from you this evening as a registered provisional psychologist and doctoral candidate i'm also a mum. And I think my little one is actually watching tonight. Thanks, Dad, first of all, uh, for taking you know uh, his support to next level this evening because she is a fresh two-year-old and we also have a brand new puppy. And so um, everyone send my husband really good vibes <laughs> uh, throughout this presentation. And the other piece that I think is always important to express is that I sit across from you today as somebody with actual lived experience. And so as Ajima shared is that my birth trauma is by way of midwifery violence and in a, an excessive postpartum hemorrhage that required blood transfusions. So I feel like it's important to acknowledge that because I am not just coming at this from a lens of being a professional and from the research aspect, but again, the lived experience of knowing what this is like. So I wanted to start off by also acknowledging that this topic is really difficult and this is not a light evening of conversation that you've all uh, decided to join me on, but it's something that you may need to give yourself space around. So the psychologist in me needs to show up in this moment and really encourage all of you to pay attention to your own needs throughout it. And so pay attention to what your body is trying to say to you, your mind, as well as any feelings that are starting to come up. Because this is a very unique presentation for me in terms of usually when I deliver, I know who's sitting in front of me, whether it's providers that I'm speaking to about how to do trauma-informed care, or if it's a group of birth trauma survivors or somebody on their podcast. But this is unique because I actually don't know who is listening. And so I'm speaking to all of you individually in this moment, though, and asking that you do take really good care of yourself. And sometimes that involves the following things where I don't think we get permission enough to zone out and to daydream or to get up and move, to dissociate even. It's a really great coping strategy that we have. And so feel like you can take liberty with doing that this evening. And uh, as she shared, I uh, this is also unique for me because usually I'm a person who invites being interrupted, where I say to people, go for it. Like if you have a question, um, pop it in the chat and I will answer it. But this evening there is going to be a Q&A at the end. Okay, so what is birth trauma? Um, I want to start off by talking about that there is no official diagnosis of this in the DSM. And so the things that I'm going to be sharing throughout this presentation tonight, it's going to be speaking to the providers that are in the space. It's going to be speaking to people who maybe think that this is an experience that they have had themselves or survivors, or even just those of you who showed up just to learn more about this. This is going to cover that entire span. So you're going to get a great deal of information this evening. That's my hope. So there is no official diagnosis. And so when we can when we talk about birth trauma as clinicians, we're often looking to post 
postpartum uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so PPTSD is uh, very similar to the traditional PTSD that we all know. And so the symptoms that you're gonna see later, there's um, all of those that are present with the survivor, but then there's also the extra layer of the postpartum struggles that often come as well. Things like bonding struggles or sex and intimacy issues often present too. So to me, when somebody asks me, what is birth trauma? I explain to them that it is anything that exceeds the nervous system's ability to cope. And whether that's before, during, or after the birth experience. So often people just think that birth trauma was the exact moment of birth. Uh, but I'm always quick to explain it can be things that were leading up to it, the moment of birth, or even like hours, days, or even weeks after that experience. When we talk in the birth trauma community about being it being subjective, what we mean by that is that we used to say it's in the eye of the beholder. And when I first started in this area, I used to say that too. And then I realized it didn't always land with people because when you say something like it's in the eye of the beholder, then it also kind of insinuates that there's some kind of responsibility, like it was a choice that somebody is making. And so I like to explain that subjectivity and in the eye of the beholder is not a choice, but instead it's one that the nervous system made for that person. So they're not deciding that they had birth trauma, their body and the system within decided that for them. I also wanted to touch on that it's not new or a fad. Um, you know, myself and other Instagrams are starting to pop up. And so sometimes I'll get people messaging me saying, like, don't you just think this is a fad? Like, is this just like the new exciting thing to talk about uh, with postpartum? And I explain pretty quickly to people that, no, I think this has been around for as long as birthing experiences have been around. So as long as the world has existed, this has taken place. But what we're starting to see in our community is that people feel stronger and uh, much more brave to start talking about their experiences and that social media is offering that place. So the clinical diagnosis around this, what us clinicians who have showed up tonight uh, would wanna be looking for or GPs or other providers is that for the clinical diagnosis, you need these four different categories of symptoms to appear. So that's persistence of re-experiencing of the trauma. So that comes in the form of intrusive thoughts as well as flashbacks and nightmares. Avoidance of the stimuli. So often what I hear from survivors is that they will do everything to avoid the place where the birth trauma like was born essentially. And so if they're headed somewhere near the hospital, they'll take a different route because they don't wanna be reminded of that. Or they won't show up to doctor's appointments that they actually need to go to because just being around providers kind of makes them anxious or brings them back to that place. So the survivor also displays negative changes in their mood and cognitions um, and the inability to remember details. And I'll, I'll touch on later the impact on the brain, in particular the hip hippocampus, which is where our, uh, is like a large part of our brain that really focuses on memory. And so you'll notice that people really get confused around specific details with that um, and struggle to remember things that they actually really do wanna remember about the birth experience. You'll also see a, dis, a depressed state of mind and being detached uh, from the baby as well or really struggling with that bond. You'll also see an increase in arousal and reactivity. So I think as providers of all kinds, we need to reassess how we talk about sleep and examine that because I think it's a typical response that we all have. Um, to be like, oh, it's a new mom. Oh, you, you just never sleep. Like that's just, that's normal and that's typical. And I think that there is actually a real danger in doing that and that we shouldn't dismiss sleep or like the lack of it um, entirely because it could actually be leading us to the way of things like PPA, which is postpartum anxiety or PPD as in depression or birth trauma. So a question that we need to start asking people is why aren't you sleeping? Let's not just assume that it's the baby, but instead, you know, if you ask that question to a birth trauma survivor, they're going to say, because I'm waking up with anxiety. I'm waking up from nightmares or flashbacks, or I'm lying there with intrusive thoughts about what happened. So it's a really good indicator, actually, if we further examine that question as to what might be happening. Birth trauma and postpartum depression. 
often what I see in my uh, therapy space is that survivors will say they were wrongfully diagnosed at the beginning and they were just told that they had postpartum depression or baby blues. And it's because the symptoms, uh, the diagnostic criteria, there's an overlap between these symptoms. And so providers sometimes will think it's that. And so the key that I'm finding when I'm working with other providers and talking to them about their experiences is that they need to ask more about the actual birth experience. Because if you ask even the simple question of like, how was your birth? or what came up for you during birth, or how are you doing since then? Um, you'll get uh, way more answers than you would have um, without asking that question in particular. Trends in research. I am a nerd uh, through and through, so I always find every opportunity, no matter who I'm presenting to, to talk about the research. And I do this with my clients too, because knowledge really is, is power and it gives them the opportunity to see that they're not alone and that other people can relate to it on large scales. So when we're thinking about the clinical diagnosis of this, which is rare, I also want to point that out. I, um, in my specialty so far as a birth trauma psychologist, I have met one person who has the official diagnosis. So that in itself kind of speaks to the fact that we're not screening this as much as we need to and asking people the right questions when we see them, you know, in the hospitals or at the six week checkup with their GPs. So the rates there are smaller than what you see in other traditional research around birth trauma. So it's 12.7% immediately after childbirth have that clinical diagnosis, and then 13.6% um, up to six months later had it. So it goes up a bit. But when you look at all of the research that exists, and I have read literally every single piece of it that exists around birth trauma, is that what you'll actually find when you talk to people about their birth experiences is that one in three and up to 45% is what we're really seeing is that number describe their experiences as traumatic. Okay. I am often asked who is at a higher risk of getting birth trauma. And I will say, I get weary when I'm asked this question because I think it's important to stress to people, whether it's people I'm working with in my space or to providers or just people looking for information, is that these are not absolutes. And so just because somebody has encountered these things does not mean that they are necessarily going to get birth trauma. It just means that there is like potential there. And so some of those people who may be at a higher risk is those who were struggling with depression during their pregnancy experience, or an obvious one is complications during pregnancy or birth. So there's a lot of research around those pieces as well as a lack of support. So not just through the birthing experience, but leading up to that, if they didn't have many to lean on. And with respect to that, I often think about COVID and how it was a, just a general lack of support that existed. Um, I like to say that birth, like COVID added another layer to birth trauma because people were having to navigate that on their own. There were a lot of people who weren't even allowed to bring in their partners to ultrasounds and were finding out that they were miscarrying or that there were complications there. And so a lot of people were doing this by themselves as well as sexual assault survivors. And sometimes that takes people by surprise and they, they're wondering about the connection there. And there's quite a deep one. And what that relates to is that when, during the birth experience, if the provider is not gaining consent and doing things like cervical checks without the permission of the person or, you know, um, providing interventions that weren't talked about, that often leads to a feeling of being violated. And so if the individual has experienced sexual assault in their past, that is going to exacerbate those past symptoms and um, trigger this trauma in um, a really upsetting way that is layered because of that past trauma they've been through. A statistic that we're starting to talk um, about a lot more, but uh, in my opinion is still not talked about enough, is that women of color are three to four times more likely to die from maternal mortality. And so women of color are at a higher risk of birth trauma. It's one of the reasons why I am including this part in my doctoral project is because 
um, there are different aspects that they are up against that uh, those who are not women of color are don't experience necessarily. Uh, the assessment tools. So this is handy for providers to know, but also those of you who have come to the space tonight, maybe wanting answers about your own experience and want to see if this fits for what you've been through. And so the first two are typical ones that are used in spaces, but what I'm drawn to lately is the city birth trauma scale. And so this is newer. This is actually the only assessment tool that exists that specifically looks at birth trauma. And it was introduced just recently in 2018, so it's still newer. It's about five years old now, but it has really good reliability and indicators of uh, validity. And so that's a good sign. So for those of you who um, aren't in the research world, that's what we want to see. And um, what I am noticing with this particular assessment tool is that it's being done all around the world. So people are replicating the initial study and it's being put into different languages as well to ensure uh, that no uh, cultural or racial or language bias is existing and things are coming back positive there. So common symptoms of birth trauma. Um, these are, as you notice, as you start to kind of review this list, you'll go, oh, this really does sound like PTSD. And so people will experience things like flashbacks. And I think movies do sometimes like a silly job of showing what a flashback is because they make it seem like from start to finish, this is what the person is experiencing when a flashback can even be a bodily sensation. And so it's not as, um, as I guess, glamorous as the movies make it. And it's not this extended movie scene that takes place for survivors. Sometimes it's seconds long, sometimes it's hours long, depending on the state that they're in during that flashback. You'll also experience nightmares going through this. And so, um, you know, I, I like to share parts of my own birth trauma through uh, this experience, because as I shared, when we speak to real lived experience, it makes it more real. And um, it puts a face behind the things that we're talking about. And so when I first, um, you know, was a birth trauma survivor, the nightmares were constant. I would say for the first six months, I would wake up each night and uh, they were often reoccurring. So that's what you'll hear from survivors is that there's usually a general theme ar around it. It's not necessarily even tied and looks exactly like the birth trauma, but will be something that symbolizes it as well as intrusive thoughts. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what that means, is they're scary thoughts, they're uncomfortable thoughts. Um, like, you know, uh, what if my baby dies? That's a, a really common intrusive thought for, for a lot of different survivors, especially those whose littles went through the NICU experience. And so coming home um, doesn't always feel like a place of safety to them. Instead, it feels like, well, now the nurses aren't with me to help me if something happens or a doctor isn't nearby. And so there's a lot of what ifs that take place for survivors, which leads me to my next one, which is anxiety. As well as depression-like symptoms, which I touched on already, and bonding struggles with baby. And there's a great deal of guilt and shame that is connected to that, as well as like breastfeeding struggles. A lot of people can't breastfeed after birth trauma. Uh, for me personally, I wasn't able to because of the excessive hemorrhage that took place. My body was too busy producing, you know, <laughs> things that I really needed in order for me to survive that it wasn't able to focus on that part. And so there's a lot of struggles that people go through when initially their hopes and their dreams tied to their birthing experience don't take place. You'll also see sex and intimacy issues, um, depending on what the birth trauma was like, if there was a lot of physical long-term pain that they were dealing with, or if they felt that the provider um, assaulted them in some way that can prolong um, the sex and intimacy with existing in their lives. And dissociation. So dissociation is um, where essentially the system becomes so flooded that it's not able to stay present in the moment. And so it's almost like an out of body experience where the person feels like they're just kind of watching what takes place. Okay, so um, this is a very long list. Um, this isn't all of it, there's, there's quite a few pages. 
So I'm not going to name every single one. I'm going to give you all a moment to read what's on here, and I'll probably speak to one or two off of each page. And I will say that this is not an exhaustive list, and I really stress that to people because I don't want anyone here tonight um, who is a survivor and doesn't see what they identify as their cause uh, to feel like it's been dismissed or minimized. That's really important to me. So if yours wasn't on here tonight, please feel free to reach out to me and say, hey, can you make sure that you add this to that list next time? I'm always open to feedback around this. And so, as you'll see, there's a variety of different things. We're in the midst of Caesarean Awareness Month. And so we talk often during this month about how birth trauma comes from emergency situations around this, but also non-emergency too. And so you'll see sometimes a divide within that community because people think that, oh, it's not traumatic because it wasn't an emergency. But just because something is planned doesn't mean it can't, it can't leave somebody feeling um, all of those symptoms that I just discussed. Um, for this one, I think I'll touch on fast labor because there's this notion that if it goes quick, it's great. And um, I used to think that until I experienced it. <laughs> and, and, and until a lot of other survivors in my space also had a beginning of their labor be quite quick and spoke to how distressing that was. is because, yes, we want this to be over as quickly as possible, but when we're not ready for it and it kind of comes out of nowhere, our mind doesn't have the ability to catch up to our, what our body is doing. And that's really distressing because it brings on that lack of control. And a lack of control is often at the root of birth trauma for survivors. So you'll see a variety of different things here as well. Uh, the one I'd love to touch on here is around lack of communication. I think sometimes when things are moving fast in spaces where uh, childbirth is taking place, that people just kind of get in the zone and tunnel vision and just want to do their jobs. But we have to remember that there's a human being there who is scared, so and nervous and excited and all of those feelings. And even if this is their, you know, second or fifth child, it's still a new experience for them because it's a new birth. And so I think it's really important that we slow things down even for a moment, just to acknowledge that person across from us and communicate what's happening. And I will tell you, it will save a world of pain to somebody across from you if you are just able to communicate and say, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Do we have your consent? Does this make sense? Do you have questions? It lets them really know that they're seen and that they exist in that space. And so much of the birth trauma that I hear about, it, it centers around this. Um, and just like a lack of eye contact or people will describe feeling like a piece of meat on the operating table and like they didn't exist and that they were just a body there and so there's really small things that we can do that will make a world of a difference to a survivor um here um oh, there's so many things that i want to talk about that it's like which one um you know there's a lot of physical damage that takes place to the body uh, that we don't take the time to consider um, when I think I didn't have a cesarean, my birth after birthing at home in the water and then asking to be moved to the hospital because I knew that something was wrong with me, I could instinctually feel it. Um, when I got there, it ended up turning into a forcep delivery and an episiotomy. And we don't talk enough about the long-term impacts of the physical pain that you experience. And going back to cesarean awareness month is that, you know, how many surgeries can you think of that are that intense that then demand, you know, that the person be up and moving within six weeks and that that's the expectation. So there's a lot of things that I think we really need to adjust our expectations around and be a little bit more realistic of what we're asking people to do after these experiences. Um, partner not being, uh, not allowed to be there. So as I addressed with COVID is that, um, I am a COVID mom myself. And so I was lucky enough to have my partner Ryan there with me throughout, um, all of the ultrasounds, but I couldn't imagine going through a single one without him. 
And I know a lot of people who didn't have um, their partners even there being able to attend the birth because of concerns with COVID. So I think there's going to be a lot of research that comes out around that that's just starting to appear. Um, I want to stress this. It's one of the myths in the birthing community is that birth trauma only happens in hospitals. And, um, and then uh, they get to know my story a little bit more and realize that birth, birth trauma can happen anywhere. So for me, I can't go into detail about this part for a variety of different reasons due to a reporting process, um, but my birth trauma took place at home. And so even though um, I, you know, can speak to birth trauma in terms of it taking place there and at the hospital, it's, it's something that I think is often missed and that people try and say it only exists in hospitals. And if we avoid hospitals, we'll avoid birth trauma. And there is a whole uh, variety of people, a massive amount of people that we dismiss with those statements. And so it can happen on the way to the hospital. I've known people who have gave birth, you know, on the way there in the car as well. And so I think that when we ensure to include that this can happen to anyone, anywhere, then we make more space for uh, more voices to be heard around this. The long-term impacts of birth trauma. So I'm going to speak directly to mine while you all have the opportunity um, to read over this list, which again is not exhaustive. As I shared is that I had an excessive postpartum hemorrhage. And what that means is that I lost a great deal of blood. And uh, my understanding, it was over half the blood in my body it was around two liters and required blood transfusions as a result and baked iron. And we were in the hospital for a few days. And so it was a pretty scary situation. And um, what happened afterwards was that six weeks later, I hemorrhaged again. And for those of you who are unaware of this, is that an excessive hemorrhage, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, can actually take place up to 12 weeks after giving birth. And this is information I did not know until this took place to me. And so what happened was that I was at home with my daughter, just the two of us, and stood up and felt a gush. And was very confused as to what was happening and went to the bathroom and, and saw and I knew immediately that something was not right and contacted my GP as well as my partner. And my GP was like, you need to go to the hospital. Like, I think this is serious. I think that you might be hemorrhaging again. And I refused to go initially. And this really speaks to the impact of birth trauma and the long lasting impacts that it can have in terms of somebody's trust as well as the fear that we can experience when we have to go back into those spaces that we never want to revisit again. And so initially, I remember telling my partner, I'm not going, I'm not going to the hospital. I just spent a week in there. I went, just went through so much. I was just starting to navigate my own birth trauma symptoms. And it took a great deal of convincing to get me there, only to discover that it was a routine placenta that had happened for me. And so as a result, I required a DNC surgery to remove that. And I had to do that without my partner because of COVID. And I had to do that without my daughter. And it was one of the hardest parts of my birth trauma experience because all I wanted was to be with my partner and my daughter while I navigated a really difficult, scary moment after just being traumatized six weeks earlier. And I share this particular long-term impact because it doesn't stop there. So as a result of the DNC and being in the hospital, I caught something called C. diff. Now, when I am in the presence of people where I can see their faces during this point, I always have a few nurses or doctors in the room that go, oh no. For those of you who don't know what C. diff is, is that it's a terrible um, virus and you become incredibly sick from this. Um, throwing up, needing to go to the bathroom. I'll spare you all of the details, um, but it's constant. It's not like it's a wave and passes. You are in the bathroom for sometimes hours at a time. 
And um, what happened for me is that usually you take a dose of vancomycin, a very strong medication that gets rid of your good cells and your bad cells. And so it wipes you out and is supposed to get rid of the C. diff, especially in somebody my age, I'll be 38 soon. And instead of that happening, I actually relapsed three more times. So a total of four times with C. diff. This was an aggressive form. It would not leave my body. Here I was a brand new first time mom with my little. As my partner's working, I'm dealing with C. diff. I'm dealing with birth trauma symptoms and um, just continuously so sick. And as a result, I actually became a participant with the U of A um, and had and underwent a fecal transplant. Like these are words. And as I say them to you, I can say them so nonchalantly now at this point, but it's like, these are things that I never knew existed until going through this experience myself. Cause nobody talks about what can take place after giving birth. And so, um, the first fecal transplant, I had an 80% success rate of it being well, and me, uh, feeling much better and it failed. And I'll never forget the devastation that I felt. I felt hopeless after dealing with this for months and months on end and went through a second transplant and it was successful. And I say that with like a, like my body like wants to tense up around it because still to this day, and I'd say it's been around a year that I've been CETA free. I am still scared that I will relapse and my likelihood is actually quite high for this too. And so as a result, I have a two-year-old in daycare. And so I'm constantly sick uh, because this little cutie pie brings it home to me. And as a result, uh, this last year, I, I haven't been able to take any antibiotics for my illnesses, like sinus infections that I'm chronic to because of the C. diff. And so this is a long story to share in something like this, but I'm driving home the fact that birth trauma doesn't just end after the childbirth experience, that for so many of us, it's months, years of dealing with long-term impacts. Birth trauma is also about what didn't happen. And so what I mean by that and what the community means by that is that the absence of certain things that were a part of their initial hopes, dreams, and wishes. And so things like a sense of safety in their birthing experience or respect or warmth from providers or healthy baby, the golden hour, that's something that comes up so often in my therapy space that people are devastated around that they didn't receive. And I'm always quick to explain to them that the golden hour has a lot of benefits to it, but it is not the end all be all. And that it doesn't get to define your relationship with your little one, that the two of you do. And that a secure attachment actually takes a long time to establish. It doesn't just happen in that first hour that they're born. As well as the absence of consent. Being able to be the first one to hold the baby, being able to go home right away. Things like autonomy in the birthing experience. You know, these smaller things of photos and videos actually break people down because it seems so simple. It's just like, oh, it's just a photo. It's just a video. But to not have any videos of your little one being born or that those first couple of days because they had to spend it in the NICU or because the mom almost lost her life giving birth and nobody took any photos of the baby or, or videos. So there's a lot of things here that I think to many people who haven't experienced birth trauma might dismiss, um, but are enough to really break uh, the individuals that I see, as well as caring to full term. There's a lot that you lose as a result of not being able to do that and all the dreams, hopes, and wishes that people had throughout their pregnancy experience. Okay, so I'm going to get nerdy with all of you and talk about the brain. Now, I do this with all of my clients. And what I have found over the years is that the more information I share around the brain and the body, the more empowered my client feels, where they can finally name it and put a label to this and go, oh my goodness, like I'm not crazy, or I'm not making this up. This really is a valid experience that I'm having. And so what you'll see is, and this is really important for, uh, for providers to understand as well and be able to identify so that you can help somebody in these situations is the typical ones that we're used to hearing is the fight, flight, freeze, OK? 
Okay. So fight is pretty evident uh, what that looks like. So that's like somebody who's getting pretty big, arguing, defensive, um, really knows how to use their vocal cords. Flight is literally getting up and leaving the situation. Now, when I talk to my survivors, I explain to them that we need to normalize the fact that those two trauma responses are not available to birth trauma survivors because they will often say things like, why didn't I argue or advocate for myself or tell people that things weren't going well for me? And later I'll talk about why that was like in terms of the brain. And so what I normalize for them is that what we typically see is that people slip into the freeze response or the fawn trauma response, which is what my doctoral project is going to focus on. And so freezing is the most common one that I hear about from people. And so that is not being able to communicate, a total shutdown, dissociation, and often people will describe it again as that experience of like leaving their body. And um, it's very difficult for survivors because they feel like they did that. And I am always quick to explain and go back to like, this was not a choice that they were making. This was a choice their nervous system made for them to try and keep them safe. Now fawning, what is fawning? So I'm, I'm so excited. I'm just three days away from starting my doctoral project um, that will focus on this. And fawning is relatively new in the trauma world in terms of us being able to identify it and talk about it and name it. But this has been going on forever. And um, it's, you know, kind of one of my theories around the fawning response. And what I'll be looking at, too, is that I think that women in particular are conditioned to engage in this response. And so fawning is people pleasing. It's walking on eggshells, it's avoiding conflict, it's ensuring that somebody else's needs are met instead of your own. And so this is the other trauma response that I hear about the most. And there's a great deal of shame that is carried around that for people where they were like, why was I asking my provider what they needed in those moments um, when I actually needed something myself? For me, um, one of the biggest moments that stands out for my own fawning experience was that after hours of dealing with midwifery violence, I will never forget looking to my midwife and saying, you must be really tired. I'm so sorry this is taking so long. Do you need to go nap in your car? Do you need a break? Is there anything that I can do? I'm really sorry that this is taking so long. And that is a, a perfect example of the fawn trauma response. And in the moment, I had no idea that's what I was engaging in. And when I was able to name that experience for myself, it set me free from a lot of that guilt and shame that I was experiencing from engaging in it. You'll also hear of um, flop, flooding, and funny. So there's a lot of Fs going on here. Um, flop, flooding, and funny are still ones that are in uh, like newer in this world, but flop um, I very rarely hear about, I think I've heard about once so far, uh, from a survivor, but, and the way she described it was that she said that, um, in between con contractions, she would shut down and fall asleep. And so that is flopping where she would literally lose time, fall asleep, come to for the contraction and then go right back to sleep. And so depression um, or other forms of trauma might see that a little bit more than the birth experience because you're actively, your body is actively doing things in birth. Whereas say somebody that was, you know, um, in a car accident and then went home, they might experience flop in the way of just constantly wanting to sleep in order to deal with the trauma. Flooding is that person that you will see who the emotions are so building up and getting so powerful and they don't know what to do or manage it or regulate it that it floods out to the point of like yelling, screaming, sobbing. And so flooding is that really like visual experience that somebody else might notice that's with them. And then the last one is funny. And so I have a, a lot of clients who engage in humor during session, during really difficult uh, parts of their birth story, they'll start cracking jokes. And this is a trauma response we're starting to pay attention to um, and acknowledge. Okay, so uh, the nerdy parts continue. These are like the parts that get, I, I don't know if you can tell, but I get like really excited when I talk about it. Because again, I think so many of you, this is going to resonate and you're going to be like, I see myself in this. This makes sense. This is the experience that I have been up against. 
So what is happening during uh, birth trauma when it comes to the brain? Let's talk about three different areas. So the prefrontal cortex uh, is one that I am constantly reminding my husband of when it comes to our two-year-old, because the prefrontal cortex is the smartest part of our brain and does not fully develop until the age of 25. So I am constantly saying to him, she's two. She doesn't have her prefrontal cortex. And I literally use that language with him where I'm like, she doesn't have the ability to regulate um, her thoughts, her actions, emotions, um, reasoning, problem solving, comprehensive, like impulse con control, all of these really important things that we kind of wish our kiddos could do. They're not so great at it until the age of 25. So here's the thing about birth trauma is that this really important smart part of our brain goes offline. And so it shuts down, it shrinks. And so for those survivors who are like, why can I communicate? Why can I advocate for myself? Why couldn't I problem solve in that moment and brainstorm and say like, actually, no, I need this. This isn't working for me. This hurts because this part of your brain wasn't functioning in the moment of trauma. Next is the hippocampus. And so this is has a major role in memory. And it's also involved in being able to process incoming emotions that are taking place. And so similar to the prefrontal cortex is that this shrinks. And so when we need it, right, in a moment of panic and threat, instead it, it just shuts down. And next is the amygdala. So that is our natural alarm system. That is like the red flags that say danger, danger to us. And it's a really handy part of our brain. But what happens to trauma survivors is that it gets stuck on on. And so we, it's wonderful in that moment to say like danger, but then we need it to shrink back down in size, relax so that we can relax and we know that the threat is no longer there. But what happens to trauma survivors is that the amygdala stays on and convinces the survivor for weeks and months on end that there is still a threat happening. And so that's why we see all of those symptoms is because that part of the nervous system is still in high gear. Okay, so I just wanna check the time and make sure. Yes, okay, good, I'm doing good. Um, the impact on partners. There's a lot of things I plan to research um, once I officially am a doctor. Um, I didn't just get, I'm not just doing this um, educational experience for the title. I really am doing it because I want to spend the rest of my life researching and trying to create change around birth trauma. One of the areas that I plan to do this around is this because we do not talk about it. We barely talk about birth trauma. It's getting better, but we definitely don't talk about the impact on partners. And so partners also experience birth trauma. And the research is showing that 26% will meet the criteria for PTSD. And so if you wanted, I have the references at the end uh, too. It's a great article to read. So is the one on the bottom here by Daniels and Arden Close and Mayers, because it directly speaks to uh, partners' experiences and how dismissed they feel in those moments and like their feelings um, and the trauma that they witnessed can't take up any space because they weren't the one that it actually took place to. And so there are a lot of examples of the impact and one that I like to use from my own personal life. And again, if Ryan is watching, he knows that I have spoke about this one um, a variety of times on podcasts because I think that it drives home the point is that I don't even know how long ago. It was probably around six months ago, Ryan and I were sitting down uh, to watch TV at night and uh, the Game of Thrones has come out with a spinoff. Spoiler alert, okay? So uh, for the next couple of minutes, shut it off if you don't want to hear this. But um, there's a new one called, I think it's called The House of the Dragons or House of Dragons. And we were really looking forward to watching this together. And we turn on the first episode and we're going about our business. And um, one of the main characters is pregnant. And right away, as a birth trauma survivor, I start to already feel uncomfortable as I'm watching um, her because I just get nervous that something is going to happen. And again, spoiler alert, something does. And she ends up 
they end up doing a C-section on her. And this is like medieval times. And so there's no drugs to help her through this experience. And as a result, she um, bleeds out and she dies. And I remember sitting there and feeling the physical reaction that my body was having as I'm watching all of the blood in that scene and thinking of my own experience. And I remember just looking over to Ryan and his head was down and he wasn't watching the screen. He was just staring at his lap. And I always get emotional. It's interesting because I can talk about my own experience, but then when I speak to his, I, um, as this example, I, I feel the emotions come up for me because I knew how much this impacted him, but I don't think I really knew until that moment. And when I looked over at him, I, you know, really sat with the knowledge of the fact that he was the one who witnessed everything taking place to me and that I didn't know I was hemorrhaging when it was taking place. I felt weird. I felt like I was going in and out, but I didn't know. And he did. And so we need to remember that there's people in these spaces that are witnessing these things that nobody's paying attention to. Nobody asked him if he was okay or if, you know, this is what's happening, this is what's going on. Nobody gave him any kind of answer. And so he was very much alone to, um, left alone to navigate everything that was taking place. And so even with me as a psychologist for a wife, I was checking in with him those first few months saying like, I know this happened to you too. And, you know, we can talk about this whenever you feel ready to do so. But, you know, for the GPs watching this is that my GP is phenomenal. She's on mat leave right now. I really want her to come back. I miss her. <laughs> and, you know, when, when she does, she'll know that I've spoke a lot about this particular moment, which is that um, during my recovery that first year, she would ask me a lot how I was doing, but she never asked Ryan how he was. And I think we need to change the conversation around that. Impact on providers. So um, people are like, what? What are you doing? You're talking about the impact on providers with birth trauma? Absolutely. It is such an important conversation to have. Uh, it's something that I also feel really passionate about. And uh, the next slide after this will explain where that passion comes from. And uh, just two weeks ago, I did a presentation to doulas and birth workers and nurses around these three things. So compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, and burnout, and how to be able to identify the difference between these three things so that you can stay on top of these symptoms and take really good care of yourself so that that spills on to the people that you're working with in a really great way. Because if we don't, and we have all of this, this can impact birthers in a really negative way. And so some stats for all of you is that, you know, one in five nurses, I think it's higher, will experience compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is when you, it's, they call it the cost of caring, which I think is a terrible label. And basically it means that you've cared and you've loved and really valued your position for so long that it's breaking you down. Um, that, uh, yeah, your heart has been so big for so long, essentially. And that as a result, um, you're exhausted from, from trying to do your job at full, you know, 100% capacity. Vicarious trauma, a stat is 40% of midwives experienced a traumatic perinatal event in the past six months, according to Slade. And so we have to remember that sometimes in those birth trauma experiences, the providers that are standing in that space too are feeling the impact of that. And um, when I recently did a presentation for... Um, providers across British Columbia, they spoke to me about shame and how much shame exists within communities like OBs and midwives and that you're not allowed to talk about your experiences or your feelings. This is part of the job, suck it up and deal with it. And I think we really need to change that culture because as a result, people are experiencing things like this and they're also experiencing burnout. And look at that statistic, 40 to 75% of OBs will experience burnout. That's too high. Now, why do I feel passionate about this? You can hear it in my voice um, as I speak to this is because this research article um, by Reed for ever changed the work that I do and the direction that I'm taking within my career and my passion because 66% of birth trauma survivors state that at the root of their birth trauma was the mistreatment by a provider. 
that's 66% of birth trauma that can be prevented. That's the way I view that stat. So I get very passionate about it. I get very hopeful. So instead of viewing it as like, you know, an us against them, which happens sometimes in the birth trauma community, which I do not think is helpful. I think that we need to view this experience that we're all in it and that we all have a role to provide around here and ways to prevent this. And to me, it boils down to true trauma-informed practices and training, that it's not enough to just say that we do it in our hospitals or midwifery care um, or as nurses or lactation consultants or pelvic floor physiotherapists, but that we are really modeling these things in the work that we do. And so, again, just wanting to drive home the point that birth trauma is often about the way that a person was made to feel within that experience. So the worst part of my birth trauma was not almost dying from the hemorrhage. It was the midwifery violence um, that I endured as a result of the mistreatment. I always like to um, talk about consent as an ongoing process because I think that this is one of the keys to trauma-informed care. And so it is not just like, here is consent, you know, here, here's what's going to happen. Do I have your permission? Okay, let's go ahead. Is that all along the way, we can be checking in with people, asking for their permission, letting them know we're about to touch them. Is that okay? Does this feel okay? I understand that sometimes emergency situations exist and that people need to think quick, but I still think that there's room for consent to exist and that a lot of birth trauma can be prevented as a result of this practice. Okay, so I wanted to touch on the forms of treatment for birth trauma. I'm also looking at the time too, um, and I uh, want to make sure that, and I see the questions too. Okay, I'll try not to get um, <laughs> distracted uh, by that. Um, okay, so with the forms of treatment for birth trauma is that I am very, um, I'm very passionate as well. Hold on, I'm going to exit out of that. Um, about the forms, uh, sorry, I'll back up. I totally got distracted by that question. I'm so used to just wanting to answer them. I was sharing that with people at the beginning of the evening as we were testing everything that I'm used to just having conversations. And so I have to resist the urge right now. Um, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a very long name and that's why us clinicians just call it EMDR is what's kind of considered the gold standard of trauma therapy around the world. And so EMDR is what I use in my therapy practice because it's evidence-based and there is a ton of research that exists around this. However, when it comes to birth trauma, there is, I think, one or two maybe now specific research articles that look at this area. And so it is another thing that I want to do with my research is that I'm hoping to get into the hospitals and use EMDR right after um, what somebody identifies as a bad birthing experience as birth trauma to be able to see if we can consolidate some of these trauma symptoms so that they don't go on to exist as PTSD. So the article that I wanted to reference, the only one that I'm aware of that looks at what I just spoke to, identified that in just two sessions of EMDR that was done immediately after a birth trauma experience, it reduced the symptoms by almost 80%. And it was double that of just treatment as usual, which I think was, I want to say it was CBT for this particular one. And so there is so many uh, powerful things that EMDR can do. And what I really appreciated ab about it is that there is something called the recent events protocol, which is what I'm trained in because you have to do an advanced training in order to do this. And what it does is that for those who just experienced a traumatic event, so, and when they say just, it can even be within six months period of time, is that if we want to avoid the trauma from moving from the working memory into the long-term memory, causing all of those trauma symptoms, then we use something like this to help dissolve those trauma symptoms. And so again, it's, it's a, a very uh, preventative tool and one that I've seen a lot of success with. I've been able to support people uh, within the first couple of weeks at birth trauma and watched it again within just a few sessions um, not move forward. So it's it's a really exciting form of treatment. 
At my last uh, webinar with providers in BC, they asked me beforehand, the people who were putting it on, to create essentially in a nutshell what EMDR is. And so I won't go into this because I'm, I'm noticing the time and I want to ensure all of you have an opportunity to ask questions. But take a take a picture of this so that you can read it later. Um, for those of you who stick around for the Q&A too, I can also post a link um, or send to those who want me to um, a two minute video describing EMDR. It's my favorite because it's two minutes and it's also a cartoon and it's just really easy to understand and put into words. But they wanted this because they wanted to be able to essentially explain this to their patients as a way to say, hey, like there's something I know of that could really help your birth trauma. So take take a screenshot of this or use your phone to um, to do so. So I'll give you a moment there just in case you wanted to do that. OK, so what are other forms of treatment. They're, um, the first two, I'm a little biased, I put at the top because I practice them myself. So narrative therapy is highly effective uh, when it comes to birth trauma. And essentially what narrative therapy does is that it helps the person to really re-examine the way in which they tell their story. Because so often survivors are the villains within their own story. And so this teaches them how to externalize their birth trauma and gain a sense of control around that and reshape the way that they view themselves. Compassion-focused therapy to me is essential when it comes to doing this line of work in general and especially with this population because so many survivors will speak to hating themselves um, hating their body, feeling like they failed in so many different ways and that they're going to continue to fail as parents. And so often I'm teaching people how to love themselves again, or maybe even for the first time in their life. And the way that I do that is with compassion-focused therapy. Um, CBT is something that you see a lot with trauma. I'm hesitant to use it with postpartum people because it can feel dismissive at times. It's really a, like really um, a great tool to use when somebody is further uh, down the road when it comes to their healing process. But CBT puts the therapist in the expert role. And I don't think that is uh, necessarily effective for somebody who maybe was stripped of their control or autonomy um, during the birthing experience to have somebody telling them what to do or what they should think or believe or feel or any of those pieces. And that's somehow, sometimes how CBT can come across. So I think there's a, a time and a place for it, but I would recommend clinicians do that uh, further down the road. Somatic experiencing therapy is fantastic. It's something that I really want to become certified in because trauma, it exists in the body and it stays there until we do something about it. And somatic experiencing therapy really helps people to resolve that just like EMDR does. Uh, you see a lot of people on anxiety and depression medications. I want to normalize that for the people who are listening because there can be a great deal of shame around that. And the way I explain it to my clients is that trauma creates a chemical imbalance in our brain and so does anxiety and depression. And so that medication helps to level out that imbalance. And so it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that your brain needs some support and some assistance. I would um, strongly recommend that it is a perinatal psychologist that people seek out in order to get treatment from. So um, you need to understand both trauma and what it does to the brain and the body. And you also need to understand the postpartum period and the different PMADs, which is, you know, perinatal mental uh, mood and anxiety disorders that can also take place. And so I think that people need to have both layers uh, existing there. And we also want a whole person approach to exist. Um, you know, uh, we need all, all hands on deck. And so that's going to include things like the GP, lactation consultants, pelvic floor physiotherapists, chiropractors, like there, it really, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. And I would argue it takes an even bigger one to support um, the parents. And so I would hope, and uh, often I'm just referring out to other great professionals who can also support survivors. So I wanted to end with this because it's one thing to hear me uh, sit here and talk about um, 
the research and the science and a bit about my own experience. But I think what we always need to remember is that behind everything that we learn about birth trauma are actual people and their actual families that are being impacted by this. And so I just wanted to end the experience with this. So I asked um, the survivors on my page to answer the following question. What is it like to live with birth trauma? And so these are just a few of the responses. That it's devastating. It's awful. It's impacted every part of my life. It's a constant struggle like reliving some of your worst moments every single day. You don't ever feel like you're present. You feel like you're in survival mode. It's a daily battle with your emotions. It's lonely, isolating, and exhausting. It's like living in the sea and the stages um, of waves and uh, the stages of waves are emotions and memories. It's like a huge black cloud that follows me and my family, never feeling in control like you have a wound that just won't heal. It's feeling disconnected from my body. It's heartbreaking. It's a day-to-day -day roller coaster ride. It's heavy. And it's like an iceberg where only the top is visible to people. Now, I'm ending on this note, and I'm doing this not in the toxic positivity way. So for those of you who know me well, who are watching, you just laughed because toxic positivity is something I talk about often, and I'm encouraging people within the birthing community and just in general society to, to really just stop doing. <laughs> but I wanted to end with hope because I wanted to um, say that as a provider, and as a person who is a birth trauma survivor myself, I watch people heal every single day, sometimes multiple times a day from this. And so if you are that survivor who is sitting here listening and in the thick of it and feel like there is no way out, there is. There is, and it comes from connection. It comes from asking for help and leaning on supports. That to me is really the key. You can have all these fancy therapy techniques, but I think that at the root of healing is actually a sense of connection with other survivors. So know that it exists and that you're not alone and um, there is help for you. And my virtual door is always open. So here is my information. And thank you again so much for taking time on a beautiful evening to uh, come talk about something that is not always easy to discuss. So thank you. Hi, Brie. Hi. Thank you so much, Gila. That was fantastic. I really appreciate your honesty, vulnerability, and of course, um, the information um, that you shared with our, our group this evening. And um, there are some questions that we can uh, go through together. And um, if anyone does have more questions, please just feel free to pop those into the Q&A box. Um, the first question is about the impact of birth trauma on children. Um, and I kind of, as that question came in, I thought to myself, huh, interesting. I wonder, is there a potential impact on um, not only like the child that is born, but also potentially siblings um, at home? Yeah, absolutely. So I love this question and it comes up often in my space, especially from NICU parents, because they have a deep fear that their child is going to remember this experience and be traumatized from it and grow up with all kinds of symptoms and end up in my therapy space on my couch one day. And so I reassure them that I have yet to sit across from somebody who remembered their birthing experience. Okay, um, coming out into the world. And so I start there um, and reassure people that also um, I get I get very cautious using this statement, but that babies and children are quite resilient. It's incredible. And I'm cautious with it because I never want us to use that to harm um, children or babies, but they have this amazing way to bounce back. And when I'm working with EMDR, for example, we do something called a float back and we go as far back into your childhood as we can to figure out where the root of that negative cognition exists. And most people can only go as far back as the age of four. 
And that's for a reason is because going back to that hippocampus is that it really doesn't have the ability to form um, memories because we don't really have language at the time to do so. And so I often just like to reassure parents that your, your children are not going to remember these moments. It's us that have to navigate them. But, you know, with siblings at home where we might see that if they're a bit older is that they'll notice that the parent, like the birth trauma survivor, maybe is really disengaged or not present or things like that. So it can have that spilling out impact. And um, I just want to normalize that and reassure people who are going through that, um, that, you know, you can get support for your children if you're worried about it, but it just doesn't have to be another layer of shame and guilt to add to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so just approach the way you try and understand maybe the impact on your family with caution, because it could end up just really making you feel even worse because this wasn't something you asked for. It was something that happened to you. So be gentle with yourself. Right. Yeah. Always important to watch and be aware of those like guilt, shame spirals that we can enter really easily, I think. Absolutely. Um, so there is a question about, um, is there any predictable or potentially maybe measured connection um, between trauma from infertility or recurrent pregnancy loss and future birth trauma after a successful pregnancy? Um, I love this question because uh, for those of you who are maybe not aware, it's also Infertility Awareness Week. And so thank you to the person who's bringing this up. Um, one of the things that I see in my space, so I'll speak to it in that, there's, um, to me, I haven't come across uh, research with respect to this. And so I've read a ton of it and I'm not seeing uh, the connection, but I know that it exists because of the people in my space. So what I see um, often is that people who have been through infertility, fertility struggles, miscarriages, things of that nature, uh, their stillbirths, um, they'll come into my space very much feeling a lot of the symptoms that birth trauma survivors have, but also having such anxiety about what could potentially happen during the birth experience. And so hope becomes this very kind of twisted, scary place at times for people who have been through fertility struggles. And so they fear that like, I can't be hopeful here and that something bad may happen during the birthing experience. And so um, I know that there's connections here for sure. I just feel like there's not enough research to speak to it. Yeah. So opportunities for more research for sure. Absolutely. Um, a good question about patient information sheets. So are there any um, workbooks or ways to teach about birth trauma um, and are there or patient information resources, I guess, that a primary care provider or um, somebody that's encountering uh, a disclosure of birth trauma. And this kind of ties into another question that came in that uh, there's someone who's a registered social worker. And um, if somebody disclosed a potential birth trauma, how how is a good, uh, how is a safe way for them to respond? Um, so I guess it's kind of a couple questions. Yeah, like that's a couple. <laughs> and they're all loaded. I love it. Um, okay, so the first piece is that there is sadly a huge lack of resources um, when it comes to this. So I um, am not aware of things that I can hand my clients. I have created them. And so if you go onto my website, I have a few resources that would be great for providers to access, which is like, what is birth trauma? As well as like the impact. There's some even grounding techniques that you can find on there as well that you would be able to hand um, to your patients. And so, no, I don't. And it's, it's something that I'm personally working on in my spare time is developing packages packages for providers um, for themselves, like information that they can have, but again, something that they can just easily hand, hand off to somebody else. Now, the other question was around like, how, how do we, I guess, hold space? That's me. Yeah, how do we respond? Um, like, how would, how would one respond if somebody disclosed birth trauma? Okay, so one of my biggest pieces of advice is do not use the language of at least. Yeah. Okay, so it seems so simple, but so many of us engage in it. It's an example of toxic positivity of like, 
oh, at least you're okay now. Oh, at least the baby's okay. Oh, my, at least you didn't die. And so you hear a lot of it just like try and like disappear um, that though that phrase from your, your postpartum dictionary or when you're dealing with clients. And so the biggest thing that you can offer people in front of you is, is an ear. And so fight the urge to problem solve, to tell them how that makes you feel or like agree with everything that they're saying. And instead, just really the silence can speak volume and as well as being able to acknowledge and say to them, like, um, that must have been really scary. I'm really sorry that happened to you. How can I best support you right now? What do you need? What are you ready to receive from me? And so those are just a couple of the questions that I would encourage people to ask. You don't have to save them. You don't have to have all of the answers, but um, if you respond with like a genuine heart and care and just hold space, that can do a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Just validating the experience. And um, I think that abolishing, at least from our vocabulary, is a great tip for <laughs> practice. <laughs> and then there's another question from a NICU postpartum nurse. Um, is there something I can tell my patients when sending them home that helps to encourage them to seek birth trauma support, especially when they haven't processed and talked about this trauma yet? Oh, it's such a beautiful question. And uh, I admire the provider that just asked it because uh, they obviously really care about their position and the people that they're working with. Um, I think normalizing the fact that just because they are going home doesn't mean that things will feel okay. And I think that's where it starts for NICU parents is that um, there is a really big lack of resources for them. And so they get home and the people around them disappear. I often make the analogy that it's like a funeral where it's like when somebody dies, everyone's around and everyone's there to support and they're there until the funeral and then they just disappear. And it's mm -hmm. the same for NICU parents. They'll get home. People will be around for the first few days and then there's nothing. And there, then all these trauma symptoms are starting to resurface and all of this anxiety and intrusive thoughts because baby's now home and something could happen. And so I think gently saying to that person across from, you, you know, you've been through an incredibly difficult experience. And I just want you to know that sometimes that experience doesn't end just because you got home. And I just want you to know that if you have, you know, some of these symptoms, that there is help for you, that you're not alone, that a lot of other parents experience this and um, you don't have to deal with this, you know, by yourself. So I think that's a good place to start is just naming it. Um, and it, yeah, just acknowledging that this could be a possibility for them to encounter once they got home. Yeah, it's it's kind of like when you uh, get the, the mesh underwear, right? Like just... Yeah. Let's acknowledge that this is another thing that you could experience in addition to like anything else that may be a red flag um, in terms of postpartum and, and beyond. Um, uh, there's a few very personal um, disclosures in a sense where people are sharing their experiences, which I really admire. Um, oh, and, I want to see these. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're in there. Um, one, a few of them are around treatment options. So um, I'll just share a little bit of the experiences. Um, there is a surrogate that gave birth uh, to a stillborn at week 23, bleeding DNC, lack of knowledge on this topic, and then grief. Um, and, and sort of what would you suggest as treatment for this individual, another individual disclosing that they hadn't fully acknowledged their birth trauma, which I think, in my experience anyway, is, is, is also fairly common. Um, they're, this individual's child is two and a half years and they're going to therapy, they've touched on it, but do we think it's a good idea potentially to delve deeper into EMDR, for example? Yeah. Um, I just want to uh, express gratitude to everybody who's asking questions because now I can see them here. And for those of you who are sharing your own experience, because it's through your experience that we learn how to do better and how to help people. So I just um, want to give credit to your courage. And so for the surrogate, um, 
which is just an like an incredible gift to give somebody. I'm just blown away by people who do surrogacy. Um, just nine days ago, I'm so sorry for your loss. I just want to start off by saying that because even as a surrogate, it was still a loss uh, for you and your body and, uh, you know, your experience of being a surrogate. Um, yeah, what do you suggest for treatment is trauma therapy, for sure, if that's something that you identify with, because it's not my role to name your experience. So even there, like I took a risk by saying like, that's a loss for you. And so it's important as providers to never name people's experience, but instead to create space for them to name it themselves. And that's why giving information like this is powerful, because if you provide it, then they can go, oh, that's me. Like, um, so what would I suggest for treatment would be EMDR. I would say the recent events protocol, because this can help you to consolidate whatever is coming up for you really quick. And so like that, the research showed that, but also, again, I can speak from experiences that you would just need, um, hopefully, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but hopefully just a couple of sessions to help you navigate whatever was coming up. Um, for the person who said, I haven't fully acknowledged my birth trauma, I, I need you to know you're not alone, that it is got to be the number one thing I hear in my DMs. Mm -hmm. So when people reach out to me on my page, it's usually how they start this off. Like I had no idea I had birth trauma until I found your page. Oh, this is what that's called. I've been dealing with this for years and didn't know there was a name for this. Or like, I've never actually physically been able to say to anybody that I'm a birth trauma survivor, that that's what I went through. And so that survival mode is um, something that we all encounter at one point or another with birth trauma. And I really want to normalize it because going back to the guilt and shame, we can often experience that where it's just like, I haven't slowed down. I haven't given myself a chance to like kind of grieve what took place. And so that survival mode is essentially trying to create a sense of safety for you. And, you know, you'll get there. And so just give yourself grace and patience and kindness as you know, you get to that point of being able to name it and, and get yourself support. I just want to read the rest of what she said. Um, I go to therapy and I've touched on it, but do you think it's a good idea to delve into this deeper with EMDR? Um, so again, I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> by, you know, saying, yes, go do this. Um, because I don't know your experience fully, but I am an advocate when it comes to EMDR and just uh, what it can do and the power within it. And it's not just myself, it's other clinicians that I work with and just the research that I have seen. So I do think it's a good idea to delve into it, but I would want to know you. Do you know what I mean to fully answer that question to see if you would be a good fit or not. Um, so ask your therapist and bring this to his or her table and say, I, I learned about this the other day. Um, is this something that you practice or, you know, do you think it's a good idea for me to be referred to somebody else while I work through it? Um, along the lines of EMDR, um, this is a really interesting question that just came in. Uh, because I've heard this before, is EMDR safe during pregnancy or breastfeeding? And this individual's therapist um, had a uh, trauma specialist, psychologist, PhD, didn't believe it was safe um, and refused to offer it because this individual is still breastfeeding. Um, and I, I think that's really interesting because we do have research on EMDR, but do we have safety data in that way? Um, I know, um, so I'm not an expert in EMDR. It's my specialty is birth trauma, but um, I have heard this in the community too, where people will um, say like, oh, I heard I couldn't do it, or I was told I couldn't. Um, I think that every clinician is different. So um, I know of clinicians who do, and I know of clinicians who don't. And so I think that's the, all I'll speak to there is that, um, yeah. I don't think I'll go any further with like that conversation, but I think it's just, it's an individual choice that clinicians make. Um, but I would be really curious as to why people think that and like, yeah, where they're getting their research and what connection they feel like they're drawing between like helping the nervous system to unlock and let go um, and why they think that would harm uh, a baby or breastfeeding. So yeah, but I, I've heard this. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, there's so many questions. It's hard to choose and we're, we're ready. I know. I know. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask you, okay, two more. One might be fairly quick. Are there any low cost or um, even potentially maybe group low cost or um, the, these kinds of uh, therapists that offer um, EMDR? Um, it, the individual is citing, you know, it's tough times um, economically and um, not everybody has coverage for um, therapy through their extended benefits and things like that. Yeah. So I would look into postpartum support international. It's one of my favorite resources. Canada finally has their own. They're still getting their legs underneath them. Um, and I'm going to be involved in that, uh, uh, doing their birth trauma stuff and, uh, their like trainings and groups and things like that. And so, uh, groups through PSI are free. And so stay tuned for that. It's coming. Um, but right now I'm not aware of any free groups um, that exist beyond PSI. Um, I really want to do group therapy. I just don't have the ability right now because of how busy I am, but it's my favorite kind of modality. And so, yeah, I, and it's so, cause it's so powerful. You really do learn from other people's experiences and their coping strategies. And like I said, at the end of my presentation tonight is like, that to me is the key to healing. So stay tuned for group. Um, when it comes to low cost, um, don't be afraid to reach out to therapists and ask for a sliding scale. So I don't know any free therapists like or like people who offer it for free, but I do know a lot who will do a sliding scale and try and work with people um, because the recession is real. <laughs> like I don't think we're talking about that enough and mental health needs to be a priority and uh, the cost is definitely a barrier for people. So Amazing. Thank you for sharing those resources. Um, I think that we will have to um, give these last <laughs> questions. Um, they're important, but we're short on time. Um, I think uh, a clarifying question overall would be, how do we share what we've learned tonight about birth trauma with either pregnant individuals or postpartum individuals. Um, and I think you've you've shared a little bit of this already without necessarily creating increased anxiety around that potential, like, oh, this is one more thing that could, did you know that this is another fun flavor <laughs> of something yeah. that you could have go, go wrong? So it's uh, the infamous question that I'm asked all the time, um, and I don't have a direct answer yet. And I think the key is recognizing that every person in front of you is an individual with unique circumstances and needs, and that it's it's not a one size fits all. And so even as I develop this within my own practice and try to encourage people to come from that trauma informed lens, I say that with the preface of you still need to tailor it to who's in front of you. That's trauma-informed care. It's not saying, oh, here it is. Here's this perfect box for everybody. It's it's being able to um, gauge what the person is like, develop a relationship with them, and then decide how you're going to proceed to share that information. But it's a fine line that I walk um, and that I'm still trying to figure out how to explore with those who are pregnant. With postpartum, it feels easy peasy to me <laughs> because they, you know, like it's they're existing in that space of of birth trauma or like they're starting to recognize the symptoms or the signs of it. That's why they've been able to reach out to me. But for those who are pregnant, it's still something that I am trying to figure out because I don't want to scare people. And when we look at the rates of this, we need to make this a part of the conversations that we're having or else we're doing a disservice. So to me, it's better to run the risk of injecting a little bit of fear and anxiety in that moment than it is to completely ignore it and then have that person come back to you and go, why, did, why didn't anyone tell me that this could happen? Do you know how often I hear that in my space of just like nobody ever told me this could happen to me? And so we need to change that conversation. It's just a matter of how to do it in a really delicate and compassionate way. Absolutely. Yeah. Th thank you. Because I think that's, that's a huge takeaway of, you know, continuing this conversation after 
this evening. And just so everyone knows that th this presentation will be available on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society YouTube channel. Um, it usually takes 24 hours-ish for us to get it up there, but it will be live there and it lives there forever. So you can reference it. You can share it with your friends, family members, whomever you think may benefit. I know personally, um, uh, you know, I found Tila's uh, account on Instagram shortly after I had my son two years ago, and I couldn't name the that I had experienced birth trauma until I under I saw what she was offering and presenting. And I have a clinical practice, so you know, it's really interesting that we can have um, this total lack of awareness, but we're starting to talk about it more. So please continue to spread the word, everyone. And Tila, if you don't mind just stopping your screen share so that I can share yes. my screen real quick. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, you know, thank you so, so much uh, for all this information. It just was fantastic. Great discussion and great questions, everyone. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening, um, and continuing to make this online event, uh, successful, um, a huge, uh, uh, thank you to all of our participants tonight. Um, I, uh, just wanted to let everyone know if that they're interested to, uh, continue to support the Women's Society, we would love for you to consider becoming an active monthly donor. Um, anybody that signs up to become an active uh, monthly donor uh, today would be entered to win a draw for this, uh, beautiful hope box. Um, you can scan this QR code, um, and it'll take you directly to our website and you can, uh, register to become a supporter there. Um, you can also learn more about our mission and our accomplishments so far. Um, and thank you to all of you who have already donated um, during your registration, um, individuals, businesses that support monthly. We're just so grateful for you. And without you, we couldn't, um, you know, bring action um, and um, change and support into our women's hospital. Um, and last but not least, thank you so much to Alberta Blue Cross for sponsoring our What the Health Talks. And don't forget, everyone, a feedback survey will be sent to you shortly. Um, if you fill it in um, and we read your feedback and we listen to your feedback as best as we can. So if you fill it in, you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. So when you get the email that you're a winner, it's it's real. It's not a, it's not a spam email. Um, and you would be contacted directly from Alberta Blue Cross. So our next uh, What the Health talk is in May, and we are talking about Hope 3.0, which is a mental health resource um, created by Dr. Don Kingston. So we hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Tila. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for attending, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you. Now.